Greetings and welcome to this presentation of Haiku Being in the Moment Flowing with the Seasons. My name is Monk, also known as Walter E. Harris III. And what you just heard was a singing bowl, which along with making a lovely contemplative sound, gives an example of what a haiku is about because just touching the bowl with the mallet once and the sound reverberates and goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And so a haiku is a very brief moment, like a little snapshot of a moment that you notice or feel or experience or whatever, yet it reflects so much more. Haiku is the shortest poetic art form, therefore one must be as concise as possible. One of the most famous haiku is by the first haiku master Matsuo Basho, who loosely a contemporary of the famous playwright, thus he is considered sometimes the Shakespeare of haiku. And perhaps his most famous Haiku, which has been translated umpteen times. At the old pond, a frog jumps in the sound of water. Now in haiku language, that could be even shorter. So, at the old pond could just be old pond. And the sound of water could be water's sound. So, if to make that even conciser, it would sound like, Old pond, frog jumps in, water's sound. So the essential meaning is the same, but that's one of the skills of editing a haiku is to is to try to pare it down to as few words as possible. So it's, in that sense, a challenging art. And it's easy to write pretty good haiku and way harder to write excellent haiku. That's how I like to describe them, because they're short um, it's a it's a writing form that works well with children, and even I know someone who had worked with uh, some elders uh, with Alzheimer's, and as they looked out the window and maybe said something brief or wrote something down, it was it was very fragmented and very haiku like. So haiku is very much not like what you learned in high school English. In fact, a lot of the rules of typical grammar uh, go out that window. Um, and um, so it becomes much more fragmented without needing to have a subject and a verb and sentences and that kind of thing. So I want to give a brief, a brief history, a brief background of some of the influences, and also address some of the basic uh, techniques and rules, and then give some of the ways you can adapt it to your own, uh, whether literary or just general lifestyle. One of the reasons I love haiku is because it helps me to connect with the natural world and uh, to, to, to resonate with this, the changes in the seasons, uh, which feels especially important in these climate, climate crisis, chaos times, and also with the uh, COVID-19 going on, it's, it's more people are tuning in. Um, which could be some of the message of the virus. More people are tuning in to nature and those enduring cycles. So the haiku, the haiku reflects that ancientness. Though the actual art form began and began to flourish in the 1600s, there are some writings that go before that. There's an anthology by Fabian Bowers called The Classic Tradition of Haiku and Anthology that the first poem... First poem starts with um, Sogi, who lived from 1421 to 1502. But farther back, some of what influences and feeds the uh, essences of haiku are Buddhist, Buddhist ways, Zen, Zen Buddhist, uh, Taoist philosophy, Chinese poetry, Confucianism, Oriental art, and linked poetry and the other Japanese arts like flower arranging and the tea ceremony and the Shinto, which is a religious, spiritual tradition, ancient animist kind of um, 
indigenous spiritual tradition of Japan and other forms of, of the Chinese poetry, all those all those kind of feed in historically uh, the simplicity um, and the quote. Sometimes you, we read a quote from Buddha or a, a con- something from Confucius and it's very pithy and very to the point. Um, or the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu has some... One of my favorite lines, and that is, the path is hidden and nameless. So sometimes you have to think about a haiku, and you have to, it, it's, it's, it, the meanings are magnified. But essentially, a haiku should be direct, and typically, you, you get it right away. Uh, a quote from Matsuo Basho, Composition must occur in an instant, like cutting a ripe watermelon with a sharp knife, or like taking a large bite of a pear. So it's a very immediate, and one of the basic guidelines of haiku is not to be abstract, not to be conceptual, uh, to show with very concrete, specific sensory images what is going on, and and also it's a very uh, diminished ego form of communication, whereas some, uh, say a novel, could be from in the first person, uh, and a lot of modern hip hop poetry is is much about one's personal experience. The goal, the basic aim, which is not to say that you can't you can't you can't describe things about yourself. Even the the masters did that because obviously we're each of us is part of the whole, the bigger whole. But the general emphasis is on the the poet being a conveyor of the information. So if I see uh, just a stunningly beautiful sunrise. Uh, and I want to convey that in a haiku. The point is not that I saw the sunrise, uh, and isn't that amazing for me that I was there at that time and I saw it, and you weren't. Um, the point is that what I felt, what I saw and experienced with that sunrise just stirred me so much that I want you to have that experience too. That's kind of the general guideline. You want the reader to get a flavor of what you experience is you experience so typically it's something that moves you and it can be very subtle very minimal um you know it doesn't have to be uh, fireworks and uh meteor showers it, it it could be the way an ant is moving across uh, up a stem ants go up the stems of sunflowers i've seen that so it could be just something ordinary and every day but there's something extraordinary about it or something that 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 strikes you so some of the basic um, technique uh, the first thing to address is that always probably the most asked question i ever get with haiku is that uh does it have to be 17 syllables and five seven five the first line second line third line which is basically how it's still taught in grade school and high school basically the basic answer is no it does not and Virtually all modern haiku poets uh, agree with that and do not write, uh, do not try to fit the 575. The reason being that Japanese is a picture language. It has pictographs, images, and they do not have the syllables that English has. It's a it's an image language. They have what are called onji or sound symbols. So the sounds that the uh, Japanese makes are 575. So Japanese poetry, for the most part, does adhere to that. But when translating into English, uh, that kind of that goes out the window. So say, for example, the word lunch would be one syllable, but it's actually like two, maybe three sounds. Lunch. Uh, lunch. Uh, it's like three sounds, two or three sounds, depending on how you say it. So some study was done that said that about 10 to 14 syllables in English best replicates what a haiku in Japanese feels and sounds like. And occasionally a haiku can be more than 17 syllables. So essentially my my basic view is that it's it's whatever works best, how, however it comes out, uh, and to, again, try to be as simple and pare it down as possible. Um, it's one of the most noticeable things when people who are first writing haiku and they show show me their haiku, uh, the, it's padded. It has extra words to try and fit the 575, so it's not as sharp. For example, just a made-up example, uh, say you're driving home at night and you see a beautiful full, full moon. So 
you might write full moon in the sky to fit five syllables. However, as a having a sharp, sharp editing knife, as um, Basho described with cutting cutting a ripe watermelon with a sharp knife, where else, where else would the moon be? So you you don't need full moon in the sky. You can take out in the sky. Then you'd have full moon. Maybe there's something else. Maybe full moon glowing. That would be kind of redundant. Full moon something. But there's more room to play around with what other words if you even want to add another image. Unless you saw the moon in the lake, then that that would be much more specific about where the moon is. So that that's one of the basic guidelines. And typically they are three lines with a short, longer, and short line. Though sometimes... There are experimental forms of four lines, even uh, written one long line all the way across. So there are variations in the modern uses for many years. But it is a good guideline when you're starting off especially, and even while I'm driving, if I'm thinking of haiku, i am got one hand on the steering wheel and I'm counting syllables on my other finger because it helps, it helps me to focus and to pair that uh, haiku to, to fit as, as short as possible. Going from that anthology mentioned before is a, one of the more recent and excellent anthology called Haiku in English, The First Hundred Years. And that gives um, a good flavor of modern poetry and modern haiku. Even some poets uh, who, were writing, who were writing haiku-esque poems before it, it was um, really specifically called haiku. One of, the, one of the forerunners or fathers of the modern haiku is Paul Reps, R-E-P-S, who has had a very avant-garde, very free-form style, and he did his own calligraphy with it, uh, not the traditional Chinese or Japanese calligraphy. Uh, his his poems are very humorous. Also, uh, Jack Kerouac did a lot of haiku. Some of them are very good. Some are not so good, but he was one of the main promoters of haiku and bringing Eastern Eastern thought and Eastern philosophy to the West. And speaking of the West, there's also a flavor of haiku, which is very much in a kind of, uh, in a sense, a native native people's tradition because with the reverence and um, ways a native people of communing and relating, as they say, with all the relations, whether a bear, an ant, a tree, the wind, a cloud, Mother Earth. Every, Every being is considered sacred and a relation and to be honored and respected. So that that is a flavor of haiku as well, where the the poems are, in a way, trying to con- convey some flavor of other than the human perspective. Another technical thing, the technical aspects of the haiku are what's called kigo, k-i-g-o, which is a season word, which in Japanese there it's very, it's very much like a science. They have different categories. Another excellent beginning beginner's book is the Haiku Handbook: How to Write, Share, and Teach Haiku by William J. Higginson with Penny Harder. And in the back of that book, um, they list the categories for the season words: uh, season, climate, astronomy, geography, observances, livelihood, life, animals plants and that's for each each of the four seasons so the simplest example is that um, cherry blossoms everybody knows that's a springtime springtime event when the cherry blossoms bloom so in a haiku if you were to write in spring when the cherry blossoms bloom no 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 (laughs) you don't need in the spring so basically the Whatever the image or the word or the plant, you know, you say pumpkin, it's October, it's autumn. So you don't need, you let, it's, there's a big word in English called a synecdoch. I'm not sure how to pronounce, how to say it. S-Y-N-E-C-H-D-O-C-H-E. I think it's spelled, it means basically like the part represents the whole. So, for example, say you were describing, uh, a, in, in a not necessarily, not necessarily nature way, you were describing, uh, say a woman getting dressed up to go out, to go dancing on a weekend. And instead of, as in a novel or short story, you, where you would describe everything about her, the makeup, the hair, the dress, you might just say, refer to the four inch heels. And that would be the, 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 the one thing that 
gives the bigger picture. So similarly, with the in the natural world and trying to convey the seasons, the kigo or season word is a uh, clue or a cue for that. In the Japanese, there is like seventeen or so different season words for cherry blossoms, as specific as cherry blossoms in the moon, cherry blossom buds, cherry blossoms falling, cherry blossoms fall in. And you can also just sometimes say, you know, winter moon or summer wind. So it, in English, it, it can be a little bit more generic and just give, give the season. The Japanese do that as well. So sometimes specific, sometimes generic. And not all haiku have to have that, but it is a good guideline to remember. And a couple more things to do with the basic structure is uh, what's called a pause or a caesura or cutting word in in um, Japanese, K-I-R-E-J-I, kiriji. And that is basically to either typically after the first line or after the second line. And it breaks up the haiku so it doesn't read as just sentence as a sentence and also gives a kind of dramatic pause so another of the mass masters uh, kobayasha isa who had a lot of poems about um, little bugs and ants and worms and flies and spiders uh, has one don't worry spiders i keep house casually and that one usually gets uh, uh chuckles or laughs when i read that aloud at, at to people at classes or wherever um, so there, uh, sometimes it's tricky to tell where the exact, exact cutting word is, but it, it's the dramatic pause. So don't worry, spiders. So the reader is left with, why, why, why shouldn't the spiders worry? Why, why would they worry? And the question arises, and then he answers the question. I keep house casually. Now that's also a good example of why haiku is a minimalist art and why it's so powerful. Because you could go to a lecture on uh, how to be compassionate, how to be empathetic towards towards fellow human beings, towards the natural world, and what about what is compassion, and what does it mean, and how do you do it, and on and on and on. But there's Issa saying, quite simply, don't worry spiders, I keep house casually. So that to me is one of the greatest concise lessons in compassion. And I, I often refer to these haiku as uh, kind of mantras to remind me of these things, little little memory devices to, to remember those things. Those are pretty much the, the official kind of rules and guidelines of haiku. And one more general rule to add to that is that three lines. Basically, there is a contrast. The first two lines set up a tension or a conflict or, or a sense of struggle and the third line is kind of um, the unraveling or the punchline of a joke or in theater terms, what one would call the denouement, where you have in, in like a, you go to a Shakespeare play and all, everything's building up and all of a sudden after an hour or so, just all kinds of, all kinds of crazy stuff happens and the whole thing unravels. And so that's kind of like the haiku in a mini form. Typically the third line is either like an aha revelation of a moment of enlightenment there's one by the female master chio ni c-h-i-y-o hyphen n-i and it goes like clear water no front no back clear water no front no back now i had to think about that when i first heard it and that was a an aha moment for me it was a revelation wow to look at water and think there's no front there's no back it's just it's it's being water so that's that's kind of an aha moment, um, and then there's some that are the very ah, like a simple a nature, a natural description that's very pleasant. That kind of leaves you with an ah feeling. And here's a good, here's one: um, cloudy afternoon, a white chrysanthemum, just one. Now here's one by Shiki S H I K I. One of the um, and these are translations, by the way. Um, one of the other of the more more modern master. Uh, this this gives an example of how haiku can just be very simple and in and, um, and general sometimes. Autumn clear, the smoke of something goes into the sky. Autumn clear, the smoke of something goes into the sky. So maybe he's looking at a distance and he sees smoke, and in that case it doesn't have to be specific, but it, it's, a, it's a, a wide-angle lens. A lot of times haiku is like a telephoto lens, but that's a wide-angle lens. Um, 
and also reminds me that when reading haiku aloud, it's good to read them twice because that is it helps. They're, they're so short that it helps to to read them twice. Also, uh, the other, along with the aha moment and the ah moment, are the ha ha something humorous, uh, which 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 leads into the what's called a senryu, which is typically more of a focus on human nature rather than the natural world. Uh, sometimes there's an overlap, so generally haiku is the generic term, but uh, say a poem that has no reference to nature and specifically about the human human interaction, oftentimes poignant, sometimes bawdy, uh, a lot of times jokes, that would be considered a senryu. Here's an example of one that's sort of combination of both why it's hard to tell the difference this is by a uh, uh, fellow haiku poet named bill kenny raindrops the bag lady nods to the beggar raindrops the bag lady nods to the beggar so there he manages to to set the scenario with one word the raindrops and then the bag lady starts to give a context of probably in a city and then uh, that the unraveling is this uh, beautiful connection between the bag lady and the beggar that nodding to each other. So uh, in just a few lines and only a few syllables, it conveys a whole human interaction um, in a very poignant way in, in a natural setting of the rain that, that adds to the, uh, the poignancy of it. Rain drops, the bag lady nods to the beggar. So the haiku is very evocative and... Uh, a little go, a little is meant to go a long way. Um, one of the best advices for haiku I've ever heard is by a uh, very esteemed haiku poet and editor, Cor Van in Hoovel, who says, write half the poem. Write half the poem. You want to give the reader something that then they can go with, and almost as if the ending of the poem leaves the reader contemplating rather than just flat out knowing exactly what's going on. And just to read, and without comment on a, a few more examples... Here's one by a Japanese uh, Japanese poet. Uh, the song bird's song, it stops what I am doing at the sink. The song bird's song, it stops what I am doing at the sink. That's by Chigetsu. And here's one I had found by a ninth, at the time, a ninth grader, Lisa Tranel, Digging potatoes, my dog barks at the shovel. Digging potatoes, my dog barks at the shovel. And here's one of mine that I wrote uh, many years ago, um, just happened to notice. Must be good friends, three sparrows gathering on a lilac branch. Must be good friends, three sparrows gathering on a lilac branch. And another way to, I had mentioned the, the uh, contrast that the first two lines sets up. Another example, since this is being uh, recorded at autumn time, is the built-in um, contrast that life has sometimes. So autumn is a time of beauty. We see all, if you're in the northeast, especially the colors of the leaves, but it's also a time of decay. So you have this beauty and decay going on, and then so you you kind of hold those two together and see what unfolds, and you you get the kind of emotional tug and poignancy and stirringness that a haiku can have. Um, most of this that I've told you is really a basic introduction. It's amazing how much there can be talked about and shared about haiku, and there are other forms that go with it. There is a uh, haibun, which is H. A-I-B-U-N, which is typically uh, a short piece of prose followed by a haiku and often used as a travel journal. Uh, there is haiga, H-A-I-G-A, which is artwork to complement a haiku. And there are also what's called haiku sequences, where you may write a poem um, about, say, blueberries or autumn leaves, and you have three or five or seven haiku all in a row that all have pertain to the same topic and then there are also originally haiku was a linked verse where the haiku master would write a start write a verse and then everybody would add to it so it's it would go on for pages sometimes so so it's not just it, it can be a very solo art form but it can also be inter interconnected like with email these days some of the other haiku masters are Yosa Busan and well the five considered five haiku masters you can look up Matsuo Basho 
Yosa Busan, B U S O N, Kobayashi Issa, Masaoka Shiki, and Chio, or Chio Ni. Those are the five classical Japanese masters. One female in there with the four men, because some of the, a lot of the books have a more of a patriarchal bent. Um, and one more couple of things just to sum up. Um, the way I look at haiku is you can approach it as in three ways, and all three can combine a way of life, a literary genre, and a hobby. So if you want to take notes or journal every day, it's a nice way to record what's going on. Got up, had a cup of coffee, saw a, a leaf fall. That's not a great haiku, but if you want to put that in your journal, it would help you remember what day it is, what season it is, and it's a good training for haiku. So there's that's as kind of a hobby. And literary genres, if you're submitting to magazines, um, you would want to, they would be tougher on the criterion, so that would be more of a literary genre. And then there's a way of life, which is just as a kind of mindfulness, paying attention to the moment, uh, heightened form of paying attention to the moment that haiku is. And that is a way of life, and they all can overlap. So there's a lot more to say about haiku, but that's a basic introduction and primer and to try to give you some tips for, for writing them. And n- almost almost none of that do I ever think about while I'm writing them. That that all kind of kicks in afterwards to to then shape and edit it, the, to edit the poem, typically to pare it down, to be more concise, to find just the right word to convey. Uh, I do also do offer classes, or if anybody wants personal instruction, they're welcome to contact me. Uh, I have a book uh, about how to write haiku, and it's also an anthology called Haiku One Breaths, and I publish an annual haiku calendar, uh, which is, um, those are all available, and you can contact me via my website, which is allbook-books.com, that's A-L-L-B as in boy, O-O-K hyphen b o o k s as in sam dot com or my email is monk m a n k h at all book hyphen books dot com or you can call me up on that old style telephone it's a landline six three one seven one six one three eight five i thank you very much for making some time to listen and um feel free to follow up if you uh, contact me with any questions and just there's plenty of books out there to read and to to learn more and some online materials sometimes there's misinformation but you know basic general guidelines there there's a lot of books and there is also I'll strongly recommend uh there's the Haiku Foundation an amazing website online uh and there's also the Haiku Society of America which does uh journals and um has contests but um, also remember that the haiku is beyond kind of any kind of national or country category. Really, it's become a world, a world way of communicating, and I, and I think very rooted again, rooted and connected with the natural world. Thus, a reminder to be in the moment and to flow with the seasons. So, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>